Hi and welcome everybody. I'm Julia Charlton and I'm Chair of the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce. And I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today for an extra special webinar in honour of Women's History Month to showcase some of the inspiring stories and experiences of women entrepreneurs from across the Commonwealth. So women entrepreneurs have been breaking barriers, overcoming challenges and driving innovation for centuries, despite the unique obstacles and barriers to success they continue to face. Women represent 43% of the world's entrepreneurs, own 25% of the globe's SMEs, and one in three high growth and innovation entrepreneurs focusing on both national and international markets is a woman. While we have indeed come a long way, obstacles remain. Almost half of women entrepreneurs surveyed worldwide are involved in the wholesale retail sectors and one in five entrepreneurs in the government and social services sector. Whilst this isn't a bad thing on its own, uh, we would like to focus on the fact that only 2.7% apparently of women are starting businesses um, in information, computers and technology the sector that draws the most venture capital dollars worldwide. And women have a lot of value to add in all sectors. In the UK, for example, up to £250 billion of new value could be added to the UK economy if women started and scaled new businesses at the same rate as UK men. Even if the UK were to achieve the same average share of women entrepreneurs as best-in-class peer countries, they would add £200 billion of new value to the UK economy. In India, research indicates the present contribution of women to, the G to GDP remains 18%. However, by engaging women to the same extent as men in the economy, India could add a staggering 770 billion US dollars to its GDP by 2025. So one of the most salient ways identified to encourage aspiring women to take the leap of faith in themselves and pursue their business endeavors is mentorship or even just having a role model to look up to. A CNBC survey at the start of this year showcased that 93% of mentees believed that it was useful to have a mentoring relationship and building confidence and helping them begin their careers. And a separate survey by Development Dimensions Inc highlighted that within their global sample, 63% of working women have never had a formal mentor. So at the Commonwealth Chamber, we think this must change and the cycle of women empowering women should continue to gain speed. And so I'm really honoured but to be joined by two young, exemplary female entrepreneurs and role models for aspiring businesswomen who will be sharing their experiences, learning highs and lows with us and give us a glimpse into their busy lives, making very positive changes within the Commonwealth. Our two speakers for today are CEOs of their companies, Pooja Lambamonga is the CEO of PLM Ecosystem. PLM is a conscious consulting firm that leads positive change management within organizations to embed ESG concerns as part of their cultural DNA. The company helps organizations become sustainable by helping them achieve net zero targets, develop community-led um, level engagement strategy for empowerment of the local ecosystems and create evolutionary leadership mindsets using specially designed mindfulness workshops that focus on brain and heart coherence, which acts as a mechanism to facilitate positive behavioral change to accelerate the evolutionary journey that eventually supports planet, people, and everybody. PLM uses on-ground action-based campaigns to create strategies and execution plans that facil facilitate an organization's alignment towards ESG concerns, that's environmental social government's concerns, as part of their business strategy. Pooja has led multiple change initiatives through technology, branding and marketing leadership support and organizational transformation programs with over eight years of experience in the scaling impact through innovation in the social impact space. Pooja has led several scale initiatives through change management, branding and effective storytelling product lifestyle, life cycle, and building high performance teams. She's been an innovation consultant for various SDG driven camp projects, including the Zero Hunger Campaign Initiatives by the World Food Programme, Good Pitch by Doc Society and Indian Documentary Foundation, Global Impact Calculation Reports by Acumen, Mindfulness Partnership for Rise World Summit, Net Zero Strategies for Indian STUs, to mention just a few. 
She drives conscious change management by following the triple bottom line, planet, people, profit, and helps organizations navigate their ESG journeys. Currently, she's working with multiple academic institutions and international corporates to investigate the, their people, excellence, and net zero targets using mindfulness as a mechanism to facilitate long-term positive behavioral change. Pooja, it's wonderful to have you here. Jamian Zhao, our other guest, is the CEO of Project Weightless, an inventory automation solution for hospitality industries auto-calculating inventory every second. It gives granular data from cellar rooms to speed rails. The solution is solving a fundamental problem within the UK hospitality sector, where cutting edge innovation rarely happens. For the team at Project Weightless, their goal is to help clients save time on redundant, tedious tasks, secure more bookings and optimize operations so they can focus on creating genuine connections with key stakeholders, customers, and critical business activities. Before building Project Weightless, Zhao Mian Zhao founded two companies in China in digital marketing and smart city consulting. In the last five years, she's worked from waitress to commercial real estate transactions. She has a Master of Science degree in behavioral finance from Henley Business School and a Bachelor of Hotel Management from Macau University. Zhao Mian, so happy to have you here with us. So now over to you, Pooja. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, I think that was a very long introduction, <laughs> but thank you so much. Nothing that uh, I have more to add, I would say. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm just so grateful for uh, Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce to include me as part of this initiative. So really grateful to be here. Thank you. Um, so one of the principles that BLM stands for is creating collective consciousness. Um, a little bit background about where this uh, concept has come from. So I have been in the mindfulness space for over eight years now, and I've always been a change management consultant. And uh, somewhere down the line, I decided to merge these two things together, because one of the things that really stops change from happening at an organization level is where people are not willing to change. You can always introduce technology, you can always introduce new, new processes, but I think it's more uh, a people-driven process where they're willing to change, where they want to adopt new technologies. And that is the kind of collective consciousness that you know we want to build. Now, to support people in taking that leap of faith. We use immersive meditative experiences. We use these mindfulness programs, uh, empathetic leadership models to make them more conscious about their actions and eventually help them raise from self to community to planet. Because when we're too driven by our own survival, that if this change happens, you know, how will I survive? What is my position going to be like? Uh, that often stops scalable changes from happening or that often stops the flow of a positive change that you know you can embed in an organization so we really help facilitate this positive behavioral change uh through and it is all backed by neuroscience and uh all the you know uh academics uh involved in change management processes so we try to merge them together and co-create uh something useful um if we move ahead, you if you can see the screen where you know we have a cusp that talks about collective consciousness, we believe uh, in creating an ecosystem for change. We have seen that uh, you can never lead evolution uh, in silos. You can never create a change if you're doing anything in silos. So uh, from a solution standpoint, it has either it should be either able to leverage the existing infrastructure or it should be futuristic enough that it can support the upcoming infrastructure. So to make that happen, we ensure that, you know, we have a 360 degree approach so that those solutions are not purely done in silos and uh, from top to bottom, people are involved in making the changes happen. So if you see, there are three separate categories involved here. One is a team level, the other one is the leadership level, and then the organizational level. Now, what we do for the team is uh, we, uh, help them getting onboarded with these immersive meditative experiences through variety of workshops, through these mindfulness practices. So they're able to come out of their survival mode. They're able to think more mindfully. They're able to, you know, open up their creative thinking processes. So these meditative experiences typically focus on a principle of five C's that we have developed, which is compassion, creativity, collaboration, 
critical thinking and communication, which are the five elements which you regardless need if you want to succeed uh, in an academic setup or in a corporate setup. So that is why we help people come out of their shell and be able to communicate, collaborate in a more compassionate manner. Uh, these things also help uh, in greatly in employee engagement as well. We feel that uh, there are three principles that we use to measure whether an employee is engaged or not, which is say, stay, and strive. If your employees want to stay within your organization, if they want to say nice things about you, and if, if they want to strive for excellence, I think you've done a good job. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, it's really important to have these kind of initiatives within an organization, which reduces your attrition and increases your retention rate as well and keeps the talent in-house. The other thing that we work upon is uh, evolutionary leadership mindset. I think a lot of times we have seen where, you know, leaders are not able to think from an organizational level or they're not able to think from people level. They are purely focused upon, okay, you know, this is what needs to done and this is how it's supposed to happen. And uh, they're not able to bridge the gap between the team members and what the organization really wants. And I think it also happens when, you know, you're not able to embed empathy as a part of your DNA, where you're constantly, as I said, under the survival mode and you just want to ensure that, you know, your position is intact and you're delivering the KPIs and everything, you know. So it sort of takes the human element away sometimes. So that is where we want to have an evolutionary leadership mindset as well. And the third one we talk about is the organizational goal and uh, alignment. The reason why we call it alignment is because we really want that from a people level, from the leadership level, and from an organization level, if there's more alignment, there's more synergy, there's more harmony, definitely the productivity also increases and which eventually converts into a positive dollar value for any organization. So these are the three things that we focus upon and uh, where we have the strategic roadmaps that we develop purely for the ESG and uh, how do we set up uh, exclusively and mutually, we have this expectation management done, these people excellence programs. We do not really believe in PIP a lot. We feel that rather than people improvement plans, let's focus on people excellence programs so that they can realize their own potential. So uh, this is a brief overview of how we have tried to co-create uh, an ecosystem where we can include every single member of the organization where they can uh, probably rise up to their potential and you know they play to their strengths. Uh, moving ahead, a lot of people talk about why do we really need these immersive meditative experiences? Why do you need mindfulness? While definitely, you know, we talk about the benefits where we say that, you know, it improves your mental health, it improves your physical health, then, you know, the five C's we talked about, there's uh, more attention, less attrition. So all of these are great. But uh, what we really want to do is we want to use the energy of your workforce to create a positive impact to create an impact where you know you're not only thinking about yourself but also about your entire environment which includes your community which includes your team which includes your uh, uh, customers so how do you become more empathetic and more in line with you know what really adds value to the ecosystem so rather than a self driven approach it's a people driven approach what is it that you know i can add for the others now you will uh, be able to see on the screen that you know when we talk about this energy uh, we focus on emotions of your team members and we try to elevate those emotions. If you can see the frequency chart, and this is a great book by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Um, it describes that emotions are really energy in motion. And this energy is nothing but frequency and all frequency carries information. So when you're constantly carrying an information of stress, of pain, of anger, of fear, you're not able to evolve your thought process and you always are operating at a very lower vibration. So the idea is that, you know, how do you increase the vibration from your own self and you come to a point where you feel gratitude, where you feel joy, where you feel appreciative. So you're not even uh, only able to add value to your personal life, to your own physical and mental health, but also to people around you. So our constant focus is to improve your frequency and the frequency of gratitude is 540 megahertz. So that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase your uh, 
frequency. If you can see that, you know, the frequency of positive emotions is, you know, very, uh, you will see it's a very different kind of wavelength altogether. So that is where we try to achieve through very intention driven and a very emotion driven approach. So that, that is what an immersive meditative experience is. Uh, these also include variety of workshops, which purely focus on healthy communication, how to collaborate, how to uh, create a judgment-free environment, how do you bring in critical thinking and creativity. So those are the things which are, you know, we continue to do. Um, then moving ahead, when we talk of evolutionary leadership mindset, this is what we believe in, that once you're elevating your role to a point where rather than thinking about yourself, that what am I doing or what the organization is doing for me, you focus on the grand design altogether, that how can I add value to the existing ecosystem? So it's a very different kind of an approach altogether. And like we said that, you know, the more increment in frequency of thought happens, the more gratitude and kindness you showcase, the more creativity, the more collaboration, communication naturally comes to you. So that is a kind of evolutionary leadership mindset, which we continue to create. And we also have a series of learning labs as well. I'll give you a quick example of the kind of learning labs that we conduct for these organizations, specifically for the leadership. Uh, another thing, when we say leadership, it doesn't really mean that you have to be a leader in the firm. Uh, I think anybody, including an intern, can exhibit leadership qualities. So it's not restricted uh, on a level basis, but uh, we have seen that most of the times uh, it's the leadership level which requests for workshops like this from us. So a quick example would be that, you know, this is one of the learning labs where we have detailed discussions and dialogue about creating a judgment-free environment. Uh, I'll give you an example that, you know, uh, if I say that you and I do not really have to judge, we really ask a question that how do you see people who have opposing thought processes? Do you see them as a hero? Do you see them as a villain in your life? Do you see them as a victim? How do you really see them? The idea is that how do you observe without judgment? How do you observe without any prejudice? And that can only happen if you're able to empathize with your team or if you're able to empathize with people you're dealing with or your customers. When you're able to understand that, you know, what your fears are, what your hungers are, what bothers you, what makes you happy, what will make you feel fulfilled, you start thinking from a very different standpoint altogether. Rather than being in the weeds, now you have a more aerial point of view. Now, when you operate from an aerial point of view, you're able to see, you're able to view rather than, you know, judge somebody. So that is something we try to create. So when you have a judgment kind of a thought process, you're always considering this is right, this is wrong, this is my area, that is your area, this is not my cup of tea. And it's more like a battleground kind of a thing where you're constantly pointing fingers at others. But we're not judging where you're purely at an aerial view and you're viewing, you know, you're able to see what people are really feeling, what are the fears of others, what are the hungers of others. And we're talking about intellectual fears and hungers here. And that really leads to everything as a performance. Like we also have, you know, in corporates, we have this performance overview, we have this performance charts and all of that. So how do you see everything as a performance that, okay, you know, people are performing to their strengths or weaknesses, and this is how I can uplift them. This is how I can support them. So this is the kind of a view model where we create. And we believe that when, when there's a world created based upon judgment, it evokes a lot of rage. But when a world is created based upon observation, it evokes insight. And that is what, you know, creates more affection. We operate at a frequency of joy, appreciation, gratitude, and affection. And that is where we want to be at. Similarly, there are more uh, uh, lesson plans like that, where we talk about how we experience life differently. Our bodies, assumptions, capabilities are very different because our senses are very different. Our emotions are different. Our imagination is different. Our sense organs are very different. So when your reality is different from my reality, I really have to keep my judgment shoes aside and I have to think of you as a human who needs support and how I can help you with your own beliefs and how you can help me with mine. So these are some of the structures which help us create a more empathetic leadership model. And these are also backed by a lot of tools we provide to them, such as, you know, competing value frameworks, expectations model setup, developing those golden circles. So there are a variety of scientific tools along with these uh, empathetic leadership workshops and dialogues, which we have, where we really speak as humans, as individuals, that this is where I'm struggling and I really need to, I, I need help. Uh, coming to the last part, which is the organizational goal alignment, 
what we want to really do is when we talk about ESG, we always think, okay, you know, these are the numbers. This is what is happening on environment. We're doing this. This is what we're doing for social and governance. It's pretty much a tracker or a compliance that we follow. If we really want the longevity of the strategy, if we really want uh, the strategy to work in long term, there has to be a behavioral change. And a behavioral change can only happen when ESG is not a compliance. ESG is a calling. You want to do something for the planet. You want to do something for the people. You want to do something for yourself as well in the form of self-love, in the form of you know intellectual stimulation. So what we really do is we bring the leaders of an organization together and we really identify the positive core that what are the things which are really, really working well for you. And we try to understand what your strengths are. So rather than having a gap analysis where we say, okay, this is where we are. This is where we have to be. This is the gap. We don't focus on that. We said, this is where we are. This is where we want to be. And these are the things which are working really well for us. And we try to do that more often. So when we operate from that level where we are focused on the positive core, we often you know, skip through the gap and we're able to achieve more than what we thought we could because we're not focusing on the weaknesses anymore. We are trying to amplify our own strength. A great example would be, you know, uh, if we talk about cricket, because that's the only sport I know of. Uh, if somebody is a batsman, if somebody is a bowler, you would never tell a batsman, hey, you know, you're great, but I think you need to improve your bowling a little bit. You would rather be like, hey, you know, you're an excellent batsman. I want you to keep on practicing and making it better. So you become the best batsman ever. And that is where you play to your strengths. So this is where we identify the positive core of an organization. And then we go to a dream state that uh, when you close your eyes, you think of a vision and you talk about that, okay, three years from now or five years from now or three months from now, this is what my dream is. This is where I want to be. And you choose very ambitious targets for yourself. And then, you know, you're able to rationalize them. Then you're able to, uh, you know, practically divide them, prioritize them. And then there's a sequence of events that happens. The sequencing happens, roadmaps get created. We develop ownerships and all, all of that. So this is how we bring the organizational goals together. And then there's a communication plan that is set, you know, that is something through leadership and through people. How do you realize that? Why we do all of these things is because we saw those three circles, you know, where we have team, then we have uh, leadership, then we have an organization. And then there's a, a synergy between the conscious consulting, uh, the, the collective consciousness that we have developed. So if you look at the overall framework, these are the things that we do. When we bring all of these things together at the same time, this is where we reach. Now, we do not have three separate circles with a mild overlap. We have now three concentric circles where things have become one. Now we are operating as one grand design, as one common unit where everybody plays to its strength. Where in the center, we have organizational strategic goals, which are setting up the purpose for us. Then the leadership, which focuses on, okay, these are the initiative and this is the action plan that needs to be done. And on a team level, then you have ownership that this is how we're supposed to operate. This is how we're supposed to behave. This is how we're supposed to perform. So it turns up into a more holistic golden circle. So rather than having, you know, like initially we saw there are three black circles with a little bit of golden section of collective consciousness, we eventually become one big golden circle where everything acts as one unit. This is where harmony, collective consciousness or oneness, so to say, is created. Thank you very much, Pooja. I just absolutely love that. I found it so inspiring. My goodness. Um, who wouldn't love to try and imbue that into their organization? Um, it's wonderful. And, um, you know, the fact that it actually works for business goals as well and um, embedding uh, mindfulness into that. I just find it extremely imaginative and also very practical at the same time. I think it's great. So I'm sure there are questions, but um, perhaps we would listen to um, Jamian's presentation and then we'll carry on with the questions. So um, Jamian, over to you to hear about your business. So um, I'm Jamian Zhao. I'm from China, born and bred. I come to I came to UK like I think two and a half years ago, and um, I think I always felt like. There is a huge gap in technology outside of China. <laughs> I just feel I, I just need to find somewhere to start. <laughs> and I, at that time, I was doing my other company called um, Great Cracker, and then also the voucher company. And the project got really stagnant. Like the Chinese government suddenly start to move their focus on on 
infrastructure and they don't want to pay consultant on time. <laughs> so I was like, um, maybe it's a good time to start a master degree. So um, I start to apply for school and went to Hanley Business School. And the, the moment I landed here in the UK, I was like, oh, wow, the retails, everything, the F&B, there's... There are some mobile ordering system, but not a lot. And everyone pay by card. You don't really, no one actually pay. Well, now they can pay by phone, but back back in like pre about COVID, people don't pay by phone. And then um, it's just a massive change of moving abroad and you just see things so differently and of what you have done and the knowledge connection you can you have in China and how how can it contribute to the UK and I was like I can create so much value here <laughs> this is great <laughs> <laughs> absolutely excellent and then um so I start after I graduated I start to I had this idea about nightclub many years ago my cousin was like scolding me uh, why do you go to clubbing like every single night? I even met my advisor when when I was out clubbing in Cologne, <laughs> no, uh, in Soho, and then, um, um, yeah, and then my cousin was scolding me like, why do you clubbing so much? Why don't you do something about it? And then he listed three 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 friends that loves clubbing, music, food, and then went on to become Forbes thirty under thirty. I was like, oh damn. I got to do something. <laughs> yeah. So, so I read some research around the whole um, UK hospitality sector. Like after all, this is the industry I know the most. And I went to the, some conference. I was so nervous. I was like trembling as an Asian female, young girl. And the people look at me and they, they start to ask my phone number. I was like, this is not going right. <laughs> and then, um, and then there were, I start to, they start to ask me, like, what do I do? And it started with a sim very simple sentence. I said, um, so I help you. I used AI to help you save time. I really didn't know what I was doing at the time. <laughs> I just felt like um, I should probably start with something. And then they start to complain about their life to me. And the notes I took from that conference, probably a couple pages long from uh, different COOs, uh, directors from different like, university student unions, um, nightclub chains, franchise chains, and like uh, global nightclub chains, like all kinds of different people. And just after listening to so many problems, I start to think like, how, how should I go with this? You guys have so many problems. I can't solve every single one of them. <laughs> yeah. So I was starting do some mock-up uh, did our version one last year and then the, the version one of project waitlist was let's say not usable <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I went back to the or uh, um a non-profit called nighttime economy association CEO um I help him we help each other on lots of things and I said, like, I'm quite stuck with our product development. Where do you think I should go? So he pointed me towards a direction. He said, 60 to 70% of the hospitality income coming from drink f and especially re like restaurants and nightclubs, if, not, especially nightclubs. And if you have a tap on inventory, because they lost a lot of money every year for unknown reasons, is sometimes over poor, sometimes employee misbehave. If you have a tap on that, you you have a say in the market. Even you are Chinese Asian, people think you're spying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how that's basically how Project Wayless um started. But before that was like when I found the angle to go into. Before I found this angle, my initiative was. I want to bridge the octopus test. So if we look at some early papers about generative AI and the critics about generative AI, the um, one of the things that people say was generative AI can't solve the octopus test. So the octopus test is one of the things that, imagine like ChatGPT lives in a big deep ocean and is spying on us to listen to what we say and learn what how we say things 
in order to communicate with us. But one day, say me and Julia, we were being spied on <laughs> by this octopus. <laughs> and one day this um me and Julia started um start decided like we want to meet up. We lived on the island for too long. We've got to do some project together and meet face to face. We've got to build a house. And the and then the octopus will become coolest because the octopus lives in the ocean, never seen a house before, and never scaffolded one. He only knows how to talk about it, but he doesn't know how to build one. And to bridge that gap of what data can be fit into AI is only the data coming from the physical world. And I think that's the 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 longest vision of how I see project where that should be going forward is bridging the physical world and AI of and to solve the octopus test. Yeah. Yeah. So project waitlist, we build inventory management solution. We don't build we don't just build the software. We we build us hardware and stream the data to the edge device. We had this idea, started ideating early last year, started to form a team about mid 2022 and have the version one. And now we are developing the version two and also have some progress with customer delete discovery. Um, yeah, so these are roughly the 19 venues we got in touch and they're all very interested and want to try out what Project Willis is building. And they, that comes from Glasgow, Sheffield, Leeds, to South of England, Northampton and London. And the problem is human counted inventory is time consuming and error prone. And the industry is superb archaic. 25% of the top business do pay stock takers from about 300 to 400 and can go higher a month to come in and calculating their stock manually. And total loss is about 205 billion a year in UK hospitality industry. And if they don't manage inventory, they, they'll lose 10%. That's what they're losing. And on track, in be employee behavior and also compliance training make it even harder because the turnover rate in hospitality sector is higher than every other industry and it makes compliance training for back office house stuff difficult for venue operators so business revenues customer experience and safety are closely influenced by sufficient items in stock expiry and allergens so it is irreversibly bad. That's all omitted. Our solution is simple, accurate, and convenient. A smart sensor network to calculate inventory in every minute. So the smart scales start calculating every item's volume from first configuration and let the sensor network track your inventory. And we label the food and beverage compliance in app through the sensor network. So we are building this solution to mitigate the risk in hotelier's pumps from expiry awareness, allergens labeling, and identifying the stock loss, ultimately lead to saving more revenue earnings. In a per we built a persistent database with more than 27,000 FMB items to allow data accuracy. You only need to configure once. It's hardware, but you only need to configure once and start tracking from there. So this is our application, a smart shelf pad, and the web application, and also the mobile app. So you, at the corner, or four corners of the pad, there are four sensors, and the user will be able, able to scan the sensors to configure what items is on here. And from the web application, they'll be able to see what items are sold, and the categories of different items, and they can see um, what should be ordered and also integrate with their ecosystem and other kitchen management systems. And we have them a well app to facilitate them on the hardware configuration. So the market sizing, 
some just some boring numbers. <laughs> one point one million for the current user base. We um, estimated that's probably our p- potential earning. And for the largest largest market span across hospitality, retail, warehouse, and that's a three point one billion market globally. And the competitors um, also, so some of them are manual consultants like Venice, professional stock stock takers. They will come into your shop, help you calculate it. And every other company, they they send you a mobile app and tell you to calculate it yourself and put it into our system. (laughs) Yeah. And the pricing, we span it across basic, premium, and enterprise. And the basic version is probably the best for smaller business to get started. And for enterprise, is quite good for existing EPOS providers, white labeling, inventory infrastructure, and multi-chain hospitality businesses. So we are currently raising our pre-seed round to finish our objective to build, building our, continue building our MVP and validate our cost structure. And to achieve product-led growth. We want a hardware product that's addictive to use. <laughs> also the software do, software solution come with it. And our core team, everyone is here today. Uh, Sanjeev, our software engineer, has four year experience in software development through academia publications in hardware performance and cybersecurity and the creator of web latex. He holds a computer science degree in Brack University from India. Well, from Bangladesh. Sorry, um, I'm the founder, Chairman Zhao. I have five exper- five years of experience in hospitality and real estate. I have three publications from uh, hospitality and also AI. Uh, a book I, I helped my friend wrote about ChatGPT, and two years self taught engineer. And Peter is our hardware engineer. He has seven years in hardware engineering and IoT and various startup experience. And yeah, our advisors, including industry nonprofit CEOs and Martin Bloom and Praveen Kumar, is great. The uh, my my advisor who met in the nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's it. Thank you. That's uh, really interesting. So tell me um, if we uh, kick off about um, this uh, this interesting presentations, perhaps German. What's the link between the octopus and weightless? Tell me. So the octopus can't see what's happening in the real world. And but the whalers want to help the octopus have an eye to see what's happening. Right. That sounds quite cryptic to me. Sorry? That sounds quite cryptic to me. <laughs> <laughs> cryptic. <laughs> um, okay, so Say say an example. Right now, the octopus can um, can draw images, can 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 talk like human, can have a conversation with you, but it's all based on the things that he has seen, and it has seen, but is he haven't seen a real world object. He does, never lives in the three D world with what's going on. Yeah. Right. Right. So in terms of your um, the sensor pads and so on, where are those going to be manufactured? Are they being, because uh, presumably you have prototypes at the moment, do you? Yeah. Where are you getting them made? We have to, we bought our own 3D printers in both Norway and UK. So well, engineers and prototyping in Norway as well. Okay, right. Now, I just wondered if you would be um, having those made in China eventually. Mm. I think I think China would be good, but also um, I'm quite concerned about uh, uh, legal issue and yeah, yeah. Uh, intellectual uh, property and things. Yeah, 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 that's fascinating. Yeah. So Pooja, um, thank you so much. I just that was an amazing presentation about um, mindfulness. So tell me more about what actually inspired you to do this. Is it something in your background or your childhood or your professional path that made all of this come together in this idea about mindfulness? I I would say that um, I just naturally walked into this without having an intention to do this, to be very honest. Uh, I'm a software engineer, actually. Mm. Uh, 
I agree with, you know, uh, I always thought that I'm an activist by heart. Uh, and I really wanted to focus upon uh, the SDGs, the problems of the world, which talk about hunger, poverty, education. And uh, I have been in the mindfulness space for a very long time. And uh, one of the things that I realized was that, hey, you know, if everybody, if every individual becomes mindful of their actions, we do not really have to worry about these SDGs, you know? I mean, they can be solved immediately. I mean, all we have to do is adopt to a more mindful way of living. Uh, that way there's not, for example, when we talk about shortage of food, it's actually a math problem, you know? There are a lot of areas where food is being wasted and there's a lot of area where there's no access to food. Uh, but if somebody becomes very, if people become aware that, okay, you know, this is exactly the quantity I need, not the quantity I want, it makes you mindful. It makes you uh, look at these things from a more system design standpoint where you realize that, okay, I have a role to play. Uh, so you become more conscious of your own actions. And uh, I think uh, I have always been very interested in reading about mythology and the literature and spirituality and neuroscience and somewhere down the line it all started to condense into one common stream and it, it started uh, I started to make some connections that you know they all have a very common origin and uh, these people really believed in the power of human mind in the power of your own thought and how uh, you can actually use these neural networks to your own advantage. Um, so I just thought that, hey, you know, let me just try to experiment this. So I, I did multiple mindfulness courses myself to see whether I am able to uh, embrace the change I want to see in others. And it really helped. So it took me a few years to really master it and then not really master it, but to at least dip uh, a toe in the ocean of this space. And I just wanted to spread this knowledge because in my previous organization as well, the structure that I just showed you. So we were a very successful startup. We were purely focusing on impact space in the SDG space using technology for a purpose. And with a very small team, we were able to do so much. We were able to expand our own capacity purely by using these mindfulness practices and using, you know, these empathetic leadership models. Uh, now it's just, I think it's my turn to move this baby out of the house and let others also, you know, experience the same kind of infrastructure to scale and expand in a more sustainable fashion. Well, that, that's fascinating. So have you, what kind of businesses have used this so far? I mean, you know, because when I think about the cultures at places like investment banks, they could um, really do with some of this culture, couldn't they? So what, what could you give us some examples of the sort of businesses who've been interested in adopting this? I think the best part about this business is that uh, it's sector agnostic and it's geography agnostic. Yeah. Uh, anybody can take advantage of this. We are very actively working with academic institutions as well. And mm. we're actively working with corporates as well. We are also trying to work with the government to make mindfulness uh, sort of a habit uh, in various institutions too. So that's what we're doing. So we're absolutely sector agnostic. Um, and uh, all our initiatives, I would say, have these elements of consciousness. For example, there's one initiative that we are working on right now with different corporates and academic institutions. It's called creative, uh, creating eco-consciousness, where we are trying to move or convert climate grief into climate action. So there's so much of grief built inside us that what is happening to our planet, we talk about global warming, we see forest fires. So it leaves a sense of grief in us. So rather than keeping that grief inside, which eventually turns into, you know, a disease within our own body, how do we uplift ourselves and we use that grief into some meaningful actions? So it not only supports us because we feel we are part of something bigger and grander and we have a greater purpose, it also supports the planet as well. So that is some of the activities that we're working on. So most of our work, as I said, it's sector agnostic. You know, anybody can work on in climate change space. Uh, all the organizations would really benefit if their workforce is more engaged, if the leadership is more empathetic, if they have uh, focus on ensuring that they're not harming the environment, they're not harming their own communities. So I, so I would say that uh, we haven't really thought that, okay, this is the sector I want to work. No, no, no. I appreciate that. I was just more thinking that, you know, I can see that I could fit, this could fit perhaps more culturally into an academic institution or government where perhaps they have a little bit more time, but in a high pressure environment with a lot of high pressure decision making and a very profit focused environment, which would probably be the environment that would 
benefit the most from this. Um, I was just thinking whether you'd actually tried to um, to work with any organizations like that up to now, because I think they would benefit the most. But on the other hand, it's probably the hardest for them to actually do this. Mm -hmm. No, you're actually correct. I, I think that makes a lot of sense because they're the ones who are really under tremendous stress. Mm -hmm. uh, we often feel that uh, I do not have time for mindfulness. I do not have time for my mental health. But I feel that it's not about giving an hour a day or it's not about giving, you know, a particular time slot. I think it's all about consistency. So if you're able to develop a habit, for example, the most basic thing we tell people to do is just take 11 conscious breaths. If you're stressed, it takes nothing. I mean, you're breathing anyway, you know, so all you have to do is, you know, just close your eyes and just focus on nothing, but just imagine the air passing through your nasal passage and coming out for those just 11 times. And that's pretty much it. And if every day you do the same, so it's consistent everyday effort that really makes the difference. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So, um, Jamian, there's a couple of questions that um, people have put in chat for you. Um, so, Jamian, how do you engage with AI and how do you use it in your business? And when are you going to make your company a unicorn? That's one of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, when when am I gonna make it a unicorn? I'm not sure. Maybe maybe make it into a non-profit and have come sponsor it. <laughs> That's one of the things I was thinking about because at the early on of OpenAI, it was a non-profit until Sam Sam Altman decided like um a non-profit really doesn't have enough incentive to make things good and then turn it into a for-profit business. Mm. Um how do we engage with AI and then how do we use it in, in our business? It's only if we have enough data, we can have, start to use AI. But at the same time, um, we are building our own internal tools for our lead generation and customer engagement that do use lots of generative AI. We'll read um, a lead's resumes, scoping through what's their past experience and then generate text image to help, you in, help us engage with them. Yeah. When I was looking at some of your figures, I was my, my mother actually worked in the catering industry, and I, I know that historically in the UK, the um, staff theft has always been a massive industry in catering and beverages, hotels in the UK. Um, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to estimate, I suppose, how much the leakage is from that, you know, as as opposed to breakages and so on. But have you do you factor that into your figures when you're looking telling businesses how much they're going to benefit from your technology we can't we don't want to promote this at the moment because i don't i feel like we don't have a solid solution but hypothetically it's achievable just by integrating with the ecosystem and then also with the data we are tracking in the inventory room that we are actually able to map out what item was being taken but it wasn't get didn't get transacted Either, either in half an hour or two, in two hours in, within yeah. that time span. Then yeah. if it wasn't getting transacted, then where did it go? The only answer was, was it for testing purpose? Is it for like gas catering purpose? That's the fault for them to find out. Yeah. Or just goes missing. Yeah. 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 So theoretically, we can give them a time span, but yeah. time span, but we don't know. Yeah. So there's another question for you. Can you give an example how the hardware and software together help the industry inventory of a bar or a nightclub? I think I think I answered pretty much in in the last well, question. Well, I'm asking you again clearly to expand on this. Yeah. Um, so the hardware side that only is placed under the, under the items. We're still when we're testing, we, we couldn't, we are not making it a wireless yet. We want to find a solution that we can make it wireless. So, so it can be more modular, like Lego. Um, and the customer is solely interacting with the software side. And they are, they are able to say fridge temperature, part of the food compliance, uh, allergens, part of compliance. And when was it produced? And when is it going to expire it? And what ingredient was being used in this ingredients? Then labeling them in the mobile app that that associated with the sen census and tax. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Um, there's a question for you, um, 
uh, Pooja. Um, I think you answered it to some extent when we talked about, you know, when I asked you about investment banks, but someone's asking you, who are the target customers um, for your business? Um, as I said, you know, since although it's very sector agnostic, but uh, I think that I also see a lot of uh, stress in two specific industries a lot, other than, of course, investment banks. I think one is the consulting space because uh, I have seen, consult I mean, being in the same space as well, I've seen them struggle so much. They would be getting called at 3 a.m. and they have to respond to them. So I think that is a space which could really benefit because it also fosters uh, a lot of creativity and critical thinking. These are the two very critical elements uh, when you're a consultant. So these are, I think, one of the one of the way, uh, target audience I would say I have. The other one I'm trying to work uh, through my academic connections, and you know, since I belong to the circle, I'm also trying to work with the complete startup ecosystem as well, where. Uh, it's it's a very stressful space, you know, and you do not really know what's going to happen next. It's a very unpredicted market. Uh, then we have been talking about funding winter. So I think uh, the founders and the teams, we are very short staffed all the time. So how do you maximize? I know it's a very capitalistic kind of a statement that how do you maximize productivity out of a small team? But I think this is what we really have with, with lack of funds available. So I think startup ecosystem, I would really love to work with them and help them achieve, you know, when we say that we are able, we can actually achieve 100 times more potential, it's not just a random number that I'm saying, like we say 100x. It can really, really happen that uh, once you're able to evolve your brain to a point where you're able to create enough neural network and neural capacity, uh, you can actually expand your capacity and you can actually focus uh, and create 100x more just by giving the same amount of time that you have been giving right now. So startups and consulting firms, I would say that, you know, I, I would love to work with them. So Pooja, can I make a suggestion? How about, you know, law firms, you know, the sort of in the in the space that I'm in, which is corporate capital markets. I don't do litigation, but litigation. I mean, this is I mean, it's not that different from consulting. It's very, very stressful, actually. And it also requires strange but true. If you non-lawyers probably don't believe this. But you actually do require a level of independent thought and creativity to actually, you know, analyze the law and come up with legal solutions. So I, I suggest that to you. I think law firms would benefit from this immensely, by the way. Yeah. I would love to. I mean, <laughs> happy to work with anybody who wants to work with us. Although I have to say the Indian lawyers, I know, they don't seem as stressed as we are in Hong Kong, but you know, maybe they have they maybe they have a better balance. Isn't and work is also, you know, borderless. You know, we we actually conduct a lot of webinars because all of these things I do not really have to be physically on my team, doesn't have to be physically at your location. Yeah. Uh, specifically, you know, when we were going through pandemic, we saw a lot of uh, impact of our work. We did a lot of workshops on grief management. We did a lot of workshop on anxiety management as well, which were purely uh, on Zoom and on uh, these platforms altogether. Yeah. So um, I have some more questions for you, Damien. Um, people seem very interested in your, your business model. Um, so here's one which is interesting. Well, they're all interesting, but I'd like to... I'd like Pooja to elaborate on their business sense and explain how the ecosystem works as well as what role PLM plays in it. How do you think mindfulness practice will help in today's workplace and how optimistic are you about it? Wow. Uh, okay. So I think uh, when we specifically talk about today's workplace, I think mindfulness is something, it's a very ancient practice, I would say. Uh, so people have been doing this for years. Uh, we also see that, you know, uh, most of the most credible scientists and academic, uh, people in academia that we see in always practice mindfulness and they had, they were involved in some kind of meditative experiences that they used to focus on because uh, mindfulness is nothing but to be able to focus, to be able to enter a zone where, you know, you can experience nothingness and you come back with your neural networks activated better. So I think it's not uh, just about today's workplace or, you know, I think this is something which is applicable as a lifestyle anywhere and everywhere you go, not just in workplaces, also in your homes, uh, when you're talking to your family members, when you're talking to your team, when you're talking to your colleagues or, you know, when, when, you, when you're a student. Uh, so I would say that very much applicable everywhere and in every sector. 
uh, optimism. I am very uh, optimistic because uh, I have worked with uh, in the space for a very long time and I have received so many stories. So we were working with the uh, students from K to 12 in Boston. And uh, I was working with an organization who had these mindfulness practices developed and I, I was acting as a product manager and how do we create better user experiences? How do you promote this app and everything? And the kind of stories we received from these little kids who said that uh, uh, people who have been struggling, people who are minority, people who have uh, been, uh, you know, who have faced racial discrimination as well, coming back so resilient, so powerful and saying that, you know, uh, my mental health has never been better. I'm able to overcome my anxiety. Little students, you know, imagine. And every day, as I said, consistency, just 15 minutes of practice and they come back and say that, you know, I have better grades. I have more harmony within the team, uh, within my school system. There's less teacher absenteeism. There's less teacher stress. So there's so many examples that we have seen. My one of my friends uh, who met with a massive and a really bad accident, she was able to reconstruct her entire face purely through these meditative experiences. So I have seen miracles happen. So I'm very optimistic about uh, what the space has to offer. I just think that we haven't really realized our potential yet. Like we say that, you know, 5% of our mind is conscious and 95% is subconscious, which regulates the autonomous nervous system. And you really have to be mindful enough. You really have to be, uh, you know, focused enough to enter that 95% where you can actually influence your own metabolism, where you can enter and you can understand your own body. Uh, so I think this mindfulness never goes out of style, I would say that. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jamia, and somebody really is asking a very detailed question, which I think is super interesting. How does your inventory management system compare with Hong Kong practice or the mainland? Um, and the person asking is Ronald Wells, and he says, I was in the hotel business in Hong Kong for many years, and he never saw a comparable system to the one you're talking about. I haven't seen one like this as well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that there are some uh, solutions that technology-wise that's similar. They are fridge providers. They are sell you the fridge, and they can they track your mini bar what's in your hotel room it's mini bar, and so automatically tap into your customers' bills. And they are uh, say partner up from um, collaborated with IBM to build smart kitchen systems. And there are several uh, smart kitchen systems, but they are all built in. in there are most of them, they're built in or like quite rocked in terms of like with customer experience. Right? So um, I think I probably describing it. And I do want to make it more user-friendly and more adaptable to the market. Yeah, I, I that was what I thought about was those mini bar ones. Um, I always find them slightly annoying because if I want to put anything in the mini bar myself, it's it makes the system go haywire because it's not designed for somebody to put their yogurt on top of the whiskey or something, is it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. the mini bar wasn't designed for that, but um, but in the hospitality general practice, um, especially to say for example, bartenders or uh, drinks on speed rails, they has to be in a set place. Because when you're busy working, pouring drinks, you can't really think about where the drinks are. So, so here's the next question from the, from somebody. Would this work for the rail? Um, and would the sensor panel sizing be modular based on need, i.e. cellar slash warehousing? Mm, we are not sure about that part yet. We are like, walk it and learn it and do it on the way. <laughs> yeah, so that Hopefully might be we can find out iterative answer. at that point, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I want it. Well, I want it to be like that as well. <laughs> Right. Um, and another question. Um, could a public sector version of this be used for data transparency with imports, exports, customs, etc.? That's why I was thinking saying like maybe to make it a non-profit can benefit the public sector more. But we're still until we have things running on the ground and solid solid tested, I can't. I have no answer for whether it should be public or private. Yeah, and somebody else, and they've also said, for example, public data on blockchain, yeah, which would yeah. be a whole other extension of this, I suppose. Yeah. So here's another question for you, Pooja. Um, it says how she believes. I don't know if this is true. Do they? Does, do you believe 
Um, technology corrupts today's youth. How you believe technology corrupts today's youth? I think the question is, do you believe technology corrupts day, today's youth? And how you plan to overcome this? And how would they stay focused on their goal and reach milestones? Um, I, I think nothing really corrupts anybody unless you're using it in the wrong context. Mm -hmm. uh, technology, see, it completely depends upon your usage. You know, I think that is the difference between being knowledgeable and having wisdom. Uh, people are smart enough to create solutions to end poverty. People are smart enough to create bombs that can explode the entire planet. You know, it's just how you're using your wisdom. Uh, so I think technology does, if, if you're over consuming it, I think that does impact your brain a lot because having too much of screen time does impact on how you perceive reality. So that's certainly, you know, so there has to be some sort of watch on how you do it. Uh, but I do feel that technology also gives you a lot of healthy solutions as well. For example, people have become really woke and people know about their rights more. People know, uh, people have become, become more mindful and empathetic and inclusive because uh, they have access to the internet and they, they have uh, access to voices where, you know, they understand the stories better. So I think that is how it is. Uh, but I do feel that the dependency on tech too much is, is not really healthy. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, we have these kits for students where you have this AR, VR kind of thing. And you have this virtual reality going on. You put it on and you just close your, you just watch it and you can be anywhere. I say that, uh, why can you just practice mindfulness for 20 minutes and be exactly wherever you want to be? I mean, your brain is so powerful. You do not really have to depend upon these toolkits. I think they're good to have. They're amazing to have. They're a perfect add-ons but to depend on augmented or virtual reality to perceive the reality I am not sure if I'm very comfortable with that uh, so yeah I mean they are good aids to support but they, they should not be you cannot depend on them too much that you forget your own caliber yeah but I suppose what both of you are talking about and both of you obviously have enormous amounts of self-discipline and drive and I suppose for people who are perhaps spending far too much time looking at their phones and getting the dopamine hit from the phone, trying to detach from that and get into mindfulness, or to look at digitalization in the focused way that uh, you're doing, Jamian, which is amazing, um, is a very different skill set, isn't it? And to encourage people to actually use this as a powerful tool rather than something that's dominating their own life is probably how people need to make the switch and change. And Pooja, maybe your um, whole approach to that may help people to do that. That's just my own observation on this. Mm. And um, Jamian, what I think is it's quite amazing what you said earlier about how, how sort of well, you didn't say it like this, but how the UK is not using digitalization in the way it could be when you come from, you know, when you come out of China and you, you can't go anywhere I mean, you can't even pay for a taxi in China or anything without your phone, without your digital kit. Right. I mean, I didn't go to China for three years during COVID and it was like going to a different planet. You know, I had to get totally teched up. I had to get a new phone. I had to have all my WeChat, my apps, everything. Otherwise, I couldn't function. Um, and I can see that, you know, you being in the UK with all your experience and your knowledge and your ideas, I mean, I mean, what, what you're doing now is just a start, isn't it? Because there's so much could be digitalized in the UK. Um, and I think there's quite a willingness to adopt. It's just really whether the technology is there and available and usable, I would say. Mm. The technology, I would say, is quite ready. I think it's the design part that's ready. That's difficult. Lots of companies struggle with this. About they all have a fantastic engineer, but engineers they are not designers, and designers or engineers are, I think twenty percent of women. Yes, yes. <laughs> so that makes like designing user interface and make things accessible to customers and addictive harder. Yes, 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 yes. Designer engineer should practice mindfulness. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, and yeah. and you know it's this enormous gap between what the technology is and how we can integrate this into our lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To really understand your customer. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much. We've actually gone slightly over now. Thank you so much to both of us. I've absolutely loved um, talking to you both. And I think so many people listening are going to get so much out of our conversations. And thank you so much, Pooja and Jamian. It's been absolutely wonderful having you with us and hope to see you again soon and wish you every success with your ventures. Bye, everybody. Bye.